Hey everybody. So this video right here is going to be dedicated to all of the most notable adversaries of the Roman Senate. Now, this is going to be a you know a bunch of big names, but also some lesser known names and a lot of names that have a lot of meme potential because I don't know if you guys have noticed the, the but ancient Rome, they like to fight people a lot. They like to uh just conquer a few people here and there, just just in general. Anyway. So the rules of this tier list, it's going to be focused around the main adversaries of the Roman Republic and moreover the Roman Senate. Now this is actually going to be a little complex, you know, I mean I'll try my very best to break it down as much as possible, but the Roman Senate eventually became very fluid and there was a lot of opposing sides because I'm looking at a period from 509 BC to 27 BCE and that's a, almost a 500 year period, so yeah. Anyway, I'll just like uh, get everything organized real quick and we'll get, um, we'll get, let's just get to it. All right guys, so this is the tier list. Welcome. Now, if you guys haven't noticed, there are quite a few names here. So we're going to kind of bite, take this up into bite-sized chunks, make it super digestible, and I'll just blitz through these. Now, I apologize in advance if I don't go through all the criteria specifically, but once again, we're looking at it between the periods of 509 to 27 BC. We're looking specifically at how much of a threat they were to Rome and its Senate. There's going to be a lot of variance to this. So please be patient in regards to as I explain it. I'll explain as best as I can. But until then, let's just dive on into this. So 508-ish BC, we're talking about Lars Persena. And he's a mediocre. So Lars Persena was the king Clusium, and he was asked by the deposed king of Rome, Tarquinius Superbus, to reinstate him as king of Rome because he was overthrown by the liberators of Rome in 509 BC. Even though he helped the king... It, and defeated the Romans, apparently, he wasn't able to put the king back on the throne, nor did he want to send a monarchy into Rome. And according to the legends, it says that this guy named Scabola burned his own hand in order to do that. But it's 50-50. We don't, we don't really know exactly what his reasons were behind it. The guy that comes in after him is Lars Tolumnius, and he's weak. Now, Lars Tolumnius was the king of the Vei during the 440s BCE, and he was killed in 437 after a battle between him and the Romans. The reason why he's so weak on this list is because he's actually rather characteristic of what happens to happened rather to a bunch of other cities that went up against Rome. He would instigate a violent conflict with Rome, he would underestimate them, then he would get killed by like a tribute or some of that. So this was quite common. This was a continuous thread that uh, often happened during this time period. If it would happen the way that it did happen, he definitely deserves to be in weak tier because he instigated a conflict and he lost. So on the other like end of the spectrum, he is an S tier. And this guy is Brennus. So this guy is a Gaul, and he's famous for being the first one to sack Rome in 30, 390 BCE. This had a massive effect on the Roman psyche for generations after this point. He made the Romans fearful of the idea of being attacked and sacked and raided. He was ruthless. You know, he coined this term called Ve Victus, which means woe to the, fall, woe to the uh, fallen, which pretty much means that woe unto you, I don't care what you say, give me all your money. This guy was ruthless. He was in for it for himself. And it really developed this sense of barbarism that the Romans hated. So he's an S tier. So next, we are going to move on to two, actually. So this one is Gaius Pontius and Gaius Ignatius. So there's this is the picture of Gaius Ignatius, but for the sake of time and space, I put him to two. So Gaius Pontius was the commander of the Samnite peoples, who were essentially Rome's main rivals on the Italian peninsula in 321 BCE. Uh, which was during the Second Samnite War. There was a series of three wars. He defeated the Romans in the Battle of Codine Forks and un took the made sure that the entire army went through an, a humiliation, which is basically just like kowtowing towards the Samnites. Now, this infuriated the Romans to no end. And that's why he's a me mediocre, because he could have easily wiped out the Roman military, but decided not to do that. And because of that, he is ranked a mediocre along with Gellius Ignatius because Ignatius was a commander during 295, which is in the third Samnite War, like the one afterwards. And because of that, he 
he tried his best to unite as many peoples to face off against Rome as possible. And I forget the name of the specific battle, but in 295 BCE, he was complete. He and a coalition of forces of Etruscans, um, Samnite peoples, even Gauls, were defeated. And because of that, they rank mediocre. Because even though they put an effort in, they couldn't stand in Rome's way. Pyrrhus of Epirus. This guy's really cool. Uh, so I'll tell you a little about a bit about him. So he was the king of Epirus, which is essentially Albania. It's like across the Adriatic Sea. He is the nephew of Alexander the Great, and he was he was able to defeat the Romans on a couple of occasions. However, he also coined the term Pyrrhic victory, which essentially is a victory at such a high cost that it's not really a victory. He defeated the Romans, but he did it at such a high cost that he couldn't get any serious gains. So this is Hamilcar Barca. So Hamilcar was the dad of Hannibal. I'm going to put this guy up into... He straddles the line because he deals Rome a decent bloody nose, but he doesn't do enough. He's nothing compared to his son Hannibal. So I'm going to put him in A tier. And the reasoning behind that was that because he was a commander during the First Punic War in the 260s to 240s BCE, but he never really was able to get the high command that he needed to actually devastate the Romans. Unfortunately, he came a little too late to fight against the Romans, but he did set up the infrastructure for his son and his, the other family members of the Barkid clan to actually overcome the Romans. He spread into North Africa and was one of the main push, pushers of the Carthaginian cause into Spain. So, actually, fun fact, one of the reasons as to why it's called Barcelona is because of the Barkid clan. Barcelona, Barcelona. Yeah, fun fact. Okay, so this next one goes into weak tier. This is Tuta of the Illyrians. Now, Tuta was the queen of the Illyrian people. In 231 BCE, she went to the, when the Romans came to ask her to stop piracy uh, activities in her waters so that you know she'd stop preying on Roman ships, she essentially belittled them, pretty sure killed a couple of ambassadors and insulted Rome. So the Romans, naturally, decided to say, hey, we're going to declare war on you. And the reason why she's in weak tier and not in, let's say, embarrassing tier, because she lost within a year, but she lost within a year because she was betrayed by one of her own, Demetrius of Pharos. And, well, there's not a whole lot else to say about her. You want because a pirate is free? You are a pirate! So, next one. This guy is a joke. He is, goes into plebeian tier. Now, this guy is Demetrius of Pharos. He's the guy that betrayed Tuta to the Romans and became their client king. Now, the thing is, he found himself at war with the Romans ten years later. And the reason why is because he was such an unreliable client king that when conflicts arose between the Romans and the Carthaginians again with the Second Punic War, he proved too unreliable to trust. Which is really pathetic because Tuta, like, she got defeated so quickly because she wasn't prepared for it. But... He was. He just got outmaneuvered so fast and so quickly that the Romans just swept him out within a year. Another reason why he's embarrassing is because he eventually fled to Philip V's court. So he fled to the Macedonian court. And he was one of the main members to advocate for more action against Rome. So not only did he lose here, but a lot of ancient sources blame him for the Macedonians choosing conflict against Rome. It's, so this guy just couldn't stop. Next guy on the complete opposite of the spectrum is well-known and well-respected today for a reason. This is Hannibal Barca. <laughs> this guy is a beast. This guy is a god. And I'll explain why. So he took his father Hamilcar's knowledge that he had honed over decades of military experience and realized that the Romans were weak on their own turf because they were constantly pushing into territory outside of it. So he decided to gather all of his men instead of like, let's say, taking ships where 
their naval advantage had unfortunately been circumvented by engineering marvels such as, let's say, the Corvus. He decided to take elephants, horsemen, tens of thousands of men, and march them through the Alps and into southern France. This is a crazy feat because he had a bunch of things going against him. He had the supply trains. He had uh, bickering uh, tribes within his group. But he eventually kept the cohesion together, and he just beat the Romans every single time, or at least most times. The most famous of them being Cannae in 216 BC, where 60,000 men died on the Roman side. And after that, he pillaged Rome for 15 years. And not, not Rome, the city, but like the territory around it. And he stayed there until the Romans decided to take the fight to the Carthaginians and invaded the North African peninsula. And... Well, <laughs> after that, and this guy had a crazy career afterwards. He, uh, he was actually so important to the Romans that the Romans dictated their policies around him, like as an individual. He fled to the court of Antiochus the Great, and because Antiochus held him in his court, the Romans hated the Seleucids. All right, so next is Philip V of Macedon. So this guy is... He's, I'd say he's like, he straddles line between mediocre and, and weak. And the reasoning behind that is because Philip V of Macedon, he had a lot of things going against him. He had several uh, people pulling him in different directions for different reasons. And, well, he deserves to be mediocre because he got Macedon involved in further conflict with Rome and continuously went against Rome's interests. And... Well, there's just too many fronts for him to fight on to re reasonably do that. He would have been, let's say, weak if, let's say, he made all those decisions by himself, but with the hindsight knowing that there were other factions within that were influencing the motions of Macedon, like Demetrius of Faros, for example, then, you know, he's slightly more forgivable, but only, only just. This next guy is actually kind of fun. This is Archimedes. The famous mathematician, yeah, the guy that founded Pi, the guy that said Eureka in the bathtub and ran naked through the streets. I don't really know what, if he actually did that, but it would be cool if he did. So, this guy goes in the A tier because he prolonged the siege of Syracuse for two years. He was debating mathematical problems, he helped build siege engines to defeat Roman forces coming at him, and he wasn't supposed to die, but he unfortunately got killed by the Roman soldiers apprehending him because I guess they were angry at him for building those machines. Uh, but many Romans didn't want him to die at all. They they respected him as a mathematician. You were a cool dude, Archimedes. Such a beautiful man. Next guy. It's going to be a bit of a controversial decision on my hand because he straddles a line between mediocre and weak for me. And I want to say weak for Antiochus the Great of the Seleucid Empire. Now, for those cl people that study classics and a couple other things, I'm going to have to explain myself, and I'll say why. So... This guy had a brilliant reign. He had territory all the way from Anat from Thrace and Anatolia all the way to the borders of, of India. This guy spread s into so many lands, had his fingers in so many pies. He was great until 192 BC when he went to war against Rome. When he went to war against Rome, he lost pretty much all of his European holdings. He lost Thrace. He lost Anatolia to Pergamum and Rhodes with Roman backing. This guy just didn't do well against the Romans. He, he just did not. He was a great king, and he was really effective. He had a great resume. But against the Romans, he, he had a severe misstep. Next one is Perseus of Macedon, and he goes into mediocre as well. I don't want to put him into weak tier, even though he does deserve it, because his rule didn't last long, it only lasted about a decade, and in the Third Macedonian War, which happened from 171 to 168 BC, he and his entire kingdom was dissolved, he was defeated, and well, he eventually was executed by the Romans. So, and afterwards he lost his entire, t you know what, the more I think about it, he, he I'm going to be ruthless, I don't care, he's going to go into weak tier, and even though I like him personally, he lost everything under rule and i blame a lot of that on his dad philip but at the same time it was under his eye that it happened Veriathus of lusitani so he led the peoples of iberia against the romans during the uh, lusitani war 
And this is essentially just a group of Celts and Celtic peoples that fought against the Romans when they were pushing in to take over for the Carthaginian land. And he was just a master at guerrilla warfare. He just kept on fighting, kept on pushing against the Romans. And I want to say single-handedly to that, because as soon as he got assassinated by the Romans, he his entire project fell apart. I'm putting him in A tier because he was such a thorn in their side for so long. This guy is very interesting in that he was the leader of the first Servile War, which is essentially the, the first massive slave revolt that happened in the Roman Republic. He goes into C tier because of a couple of factors, namely because the location of the revolt that happened was Sicily, and it was very contained. And as soon as he fought against the Romans, they, he had no additional support to fight against a organized army, so he was crushed within a few years. These guys are the Brothers Gracchi. Now, these guys were former reformers during the Republican years of 133 and 123 BCE. And the th unfortunate thing with them is that they both died for their cause. They wanted to reform the Republic. They wanted to stop the mass corruption that existed. And they were seeing that the mass wealth coming in from their conquered territories was only going to the wealthy senatorial class. These guys were buying up land and pretty much just buying up all the work with the massive slave farms that they had. So they were trying to break this up, and they both unfortunately died for it. They would be lower if it wasn't for the fact that the ideas that they were harnessing were within that mindset of the Roman people at this, t at this point in time. And this populist energy would eventually be harnessed by future politicians such as Gaius Marius, Sulla, and then eventually Julius Caesar. This is Jugurtha of the Numidians. And the reason why he's mediocre is because he was really effective as a politician. Like, he was actually infamous for bribing several Roman generals that came by to face him. And, but the thing is, he didn't really last incredibly long, and he never dealt the, uh, the severe hand in the field to the Romans to make them real in defeat. So these next guys are going to be King Boreas and King Teutobon, and they go into A tier. These guys were basically Germans that came through from northern Germany, and they're basically proto-Vikings. You can, all, you can make that argument. They came through mainland Germany into southern France, and were on the Romans' doorsteps. So the, the Romans intervened, they fought, and they got the biggest spanking since Hannibal. Like, they just like, spanked the hell out of them. And because of that, the Romans necessitated a reform such as the Marian reforms, which made the system less corrupt, abolished the requirement for men to have land in order to join the military, and a few other things. But those forces will eventually be harnessed by later politicians for their benefit. Now, so they're an A tier because even though they got defeated, they really dealt them a nasty hand while they did. Actually, uh, piggybacking off of Tudebon and Borix, I'm going to throw in King Divico as S tier. Now, this guy was pretty much responsible for the exact same things that Tudebon and Borix were responsible for, but this guy actually survived and escaped. He later on went with his tribe and his people to beyond Roman purview until Caesar's time, actually. So like 40-ish years later, he was so reviled by Caesar that he mostly went to war with him over pettiness because he killed a relative of his. So because of that and the spanking gave the Romans S tier. This person is going to be Selfius Trifon, and this guy was the leader of the Second Servile War. And he goes into weak tier, largely because of the same reason you miss uh, was he, uh, he just had the same factors going for him. He was isolated in Sicily, he didn't have the same numbers that he needed to have a massive revolt, and even though he did a little bit better, it, it, it ultimately came down to the same outcome. So, yeah, he goes into weak tier. This is Quintus Pompeius Silo and Gaius Papius Mutilus. Now, these guys are famous because they're allies of Rome. And the Roman society back then was broken up, not necessarily as every conquer person was a citizen of Rome. Every conquer person was like a secondary citizen. So as you see up on the image, it's split up into various pieces here and there. So these guys were famous for actually fighting a war against the Roman Senate for the sake of equal citizenship. Now, both of these guys unfortunately passed because of the, because of the war. But what is incredible is that 
their demands were met. Every single one of the Sokai allies eventually became citizens of Rome. So that led to the the ideal that every single person from Italy was a citizen of Rome. So that is why they're S-tier, because they met the goals that they set out to accomplish. The next person is Mithridates VI, also known as the Poison King. He goes in A-tier. Now, this guy was one of the most impressive enemies that the Romans had ever faced. Now, the reason why I'm putting him in A-tier is because, well, he... He was close. He was really close to achieving S tier status, but he just fell a little short because even though he achieved very impressive victories in the Mithridatic Wars, he lost his authority eventually, and then his kingdom crumbled underneath the uh, Ro the weight of the Romans. Now that's like that's totally fair. I mean, he fought the Romans for like twenty years or more. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to put him into S tier. He's super cool. He's incredible. He's called the Poison King because he took poisons over his life, so he'd actually be like immune to all of them. And well, it's actually a bit of an ironic story because when he wanted to commit suicide, when he realized that the situation he was in was hopeless, he was immune to all the poisons, so he couldn't he couldn't take poison. So, dark fact. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Yeah, that's that's fun. Right on. So this next guy is Sulla. He goes into S tier. The reason why is because his actions permanently dis, uh, destabilized this power structure of Rome and the Senate of itself. He essentially turned the Senate into a political tool for strongman politics, and it was a, a theme that continued on with the first triumvirate, and then later on with the second triumvirate, and then later the emperors. This guy belongs on this list because he actively resisted Sulla. He was part of Marius's faction, and part of the Populares, and as such he, well, he was one of the last members of that faction to resist. So he resisted Sulla's senate if that makes sense and in order to preserve the senate this is the part where it gets really complicated all right so please bear with me sartorius fled to spain he used the spanish people there to advance his own version of rome essentially he tried to um, make rome in his own image more or less while he was there he eventually got assassinated unfortunately but he did defeat most land armies that were sent towards him so i'm going to say he was good He's an A tier. This next one is the bringer of rain, Spartacus. Now, Spartacus goes a mediocre. I like him a lot. He's really cool. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to maintain his cohesion to actually have an effective revolt. The revolt happened in Capua. It progressed steadily. He gained tens of thousands of followers. The problem was it got so big that there was people within his faction that wanted to split off and keep pillaging, whereas he just wanted to move on. So he's in the mediocre tier because even though he had a promise, he just couldn't fulfill it, which is really disappointing. Tigranes the Great. So this guy ruled over the kingdom of Armenia, and he, at its greatest extent, it went from the southern part of the Caucasus Mountains all the way towards the where modern Israel and Lebanon are today, like where they bordered the Mediterranean Sea. This is a big swath of land at the time. It wasn't long-lived, but he was still very impressive. And most importantly, after the 60s BCE, he still was able to become a client king of Rome. As such, because of his longevity, he belongs in S tier. It's Lucius Sergius Catalina, and he goes in plebeian slash embarrassing. So this guy was in the consular elections with Cicero, and the reason why he's an enemy of the Senate is because he hatched a plot to overthrow the consulship of Cicero and Hibrida. Now, the thing is, though, they had the most capable statesman at the time, Cicero, become consul. So he found out, he kicked him out, and he ran away from Rome. So, yeah. Why are we still here? Ariovistus of the Suebi. And he goes in the mediocre tier. The reason why is because he was called by some Gallic tribes to fight off some other Gallic tribes in Gaul. 
<laughs> but um, he was stopped by Caesar, and he was ultimately defeated. And and really, he wasn't a pushover, but he wasn't like brilliant. He wasn't a real threat to the Senate. And realistically, he only just served to become a stepping stone to Caesar's ambition. So this next guy is here just purely for the meme potential, and I feel so bad for what happened, but. Yeah, it's just an example of just pure Chad dominance by the Romans. So this is Ptolemy of Cyprus, and the story behind it is this. There's this one tribune by the name of Polker who was taken over by pirates. You know, he was just uh, kidnapped in the Mediterranean. Piracy was a massive issue during this time period. And he was after he was kidnapped, he was ransomed by Ptolemy of Cyprus. He only paid two talents for him. He got really upset at him. And as such, when he went back to Rome, he passed a law saying we should take over Cyprus as a province of Rome. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so Cyprus, so this is such an unreasonable story that I just can't help it but find it, it absolutely hilarious. So this guy goes in the pleb tier because I guess if you help Rome, they get upset at you. If you don't help Rome, they get upset at you. So it's just... Why are we still here? Vercingetorix. This is the most famous enemy, arguably, of R Caesar's conquests in Gaul. He goes into good tier. The reason why is because if it wasn't for the fact that he was facing off against Caesar, he probably would have steamrolled much of Gaul. He was a capable commander. He'd won Edgar Govinda. He had a capable scorched earth policy in place to deny the Romans any real advantage. It was only really just due to sheer dumb luck and tactical genius on behalf of Caesar and Alicia, where he besieged Vercingetorix while being besieged. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a mind trip, but if you look it up, it's crazy how he did that. Four days the second goes to mediocre tier. And this guy was the king of Parthia, but how he became king and as well as how he managed his kingship afterwards, it really just speaks volumes to how, what this guy was like. So he became king because he and his older brother assassinated their dad, and then when he and his older brother had a disagreement, he assassinated his brother to become king. So this guy is basically the Persian version of Macbeth, and he can't calm down. So the re that's not why he's a mediocre. He was actually an effective military commander. It's just his habit for killing off really useful sub-commanders that made him such a mediocre choice. This next person is... Nobody really talks about him, and he's really impressive. He's really important. In fact, actually, this is not even a picture of him. This is just a sculpture of a horse archer that I was able to find. Uh, this is Serenus. Well, there's different names to him. There's like Mustaham, Serena, Serenus. Like, uh, different sources say different things. But he was a, essentially a Spahabed, which is like a, uh, a commander... Of his of the forces in the field, and he defeated Marcus Crassus at Carrhae. Why this is really important was because he, Marcus Crassus, was one of the first triumvirate. So this is like a group of super politicians that was in charge of everything. This is Julius Caesar, Pompey Magnus, and Marcus Crassus. Serenus killed Marcus Crassus, and in a, indirectly led to the conditions that allowed for uh, the civil war between. Julius Caesar and Pompey Magnus to occur. So this guy was very intelligent. This guy continuously harried the the army of Crassus. He had enough supplies to outwit and out outmatch the forces before him. And really, he there would have been a lot more on him if he wasn't assassinated by Orodes the second. Thank you very much. He was the reason as to why Orodes became the king in the first place. He was the king maker. So. This guy was really important for Parthian politics, and the fact that he got killed off after such an impressive victory is just a shame. Guys, Julius Caesar. He goes in S tier. For those of you guys that don't know or do know who he is, he, is the, he was one of the members of the First Triumvirate. He was famous for conquering all of Gaul, and he crossed the Rubicon with an army to invade Italy to start a civil war. And as such, he defeated the senatorial forces installed himself as dictator for life, and then was assassinated by the Liberatores of Rome. He deserves to be asked here because his direct actions eventually led to the development of the Roman Empire. Cleopatra the Seventh. 
Now, Cleopatra is very interesting because she was just a very capable politician. A lot of people depict her as, let's say, uh, just a beautiful and just a cunning, intelligent woman and just sexy, you know, like Elizabeth Ta Taylor and all that jazz. And she was, but she was mostly appreciated for just how incredibly dangerous she was. So she goes into A tier because she not only seduced Julius Caesar to join her side of a civil war, but she also seduced Mark Antony afterwards, after Julius Caesar died, to secure her spot, and almost succeeded in taking the eastern territories of Rome as her personal property with Mark Antony. Yeah, she goes in A tier, very capable, very deadly, and whew, she found. So on the polar opposite of that is her brother, Ptolemy the Thirteenth. He goes into disappointing tier, and there's a few reasons for that that were outside of his control, but he really didn't think things through. So to begin with, he's a little kid. His, his depictions in media have been like left, right, and center, so I'll just like break it down for you. He's a kid. He When he found Pompey Magnus come to his court, he executed him and presented Caesar his head on a plate. Caesar was repulsed and horrified by this. He single-handedly invited the Romans to fight in Egypt. He had to besiege his own city in order to get the Romans out, and even then he lost and died, and his sister Cleopatra became pharaoh. Okay, so this is an interesting choice, and I chose this mostly to talk about history, not to actually rank him, these guys seriously. This is Cassius and Brutus, who are the main conspirators of the assassination of Julius Caesar. I'll just throw them into mediocre for the sake of talking about the history, and talking about why the Senate is so fluid. So, these guys assassinated Caesar for the sake of giving the Senate the power that they lost. The problem was that it left a vacuum for Mark Antony and other strong men to come in and use the Senate to their advantage, and eventually developed the second triumvirate. They used that power to denounce Cassius and Brutus, and they eventually were defeated at Philippi. So, these guys had the idea of giving power back to the Senate, but the Senate, it, in a way, betrayed them. Because it really just goes to show that the Senate is not one-dimensional. There are several facets to it. This right here is Sextus Pompey, and I'm largely just throwing him in mediocre tier because I want to just do the exact same thing and talk about uh, who he was. <coughs> Excuse me. When the Civil War happened between Julius Caesar and Pompey Magnus, he stuck to the coasts and raided and pillaged with his ships. He was such a pain in the neck, actually, for such a long time that he was still raiding ships that were going between Rome and Egypt for the massive grain supply, and he kept on intercepting all the food shipments. He was like essentially a pirate lord in the Mediterranean for a good long while. Do what you want, because a pirate is free. You are a pirate. <laughs> And I guess, in a way, you could also call him an enemy of the Senate in the same vein that Cassius and Brutus were. But, like I said, it's, it was completely subjective. But the last two. Uh, so, first one is going to be Mark Antony. And he belongs in... This is going to be a bit controversial. I'm going to say he's mediocre. Now, before you guys get up in arms, I want to kind of explain that a bit. He... He's a really good sub-commander. Like, he's the kind of person you can rely on. The kind of a similar role and a similar vein as, let's say, Agrippa to Octavian. You know, he, he is really good at backing someone up. Has good capacity, good potential, but he just got outmaneuvered every single time. Everywhere he went, he got outmaneuvered by Cicero at the Senate. He allowed himself to get seduced by Cleopatra. He got outmaneuvered by Ant by Octavian at the Battle of Actium, and then he eventually committed suicide. It's really sad because he was really important to many Romans, but he just fell short of so many things, and he just made so many mistakes. Final one is Octavian Augustus, and he rightfully belongs in S tier. And the reason why is because he basically just used the Senate to his own advantage every step of the way. He owned all the major offices. He defined what it was like to become an emperor, in fact, actually, he wasn't even called emperor during his time. He was just called the first citizen, uh, um, uh, Princeps, essentially. Uh, and because of that, 
he defined what it, the role of what an emperor should be. And that's incredible to do. He used the Senate to his own devices. And most importantly, though, he learned from all the mistakes of his predecessors. He learned from Julius Caesar and Sulla and all those others that tried to take power for themselves. He took it piecemeal over a long period of time, over a very long career, and he was incredibly successful for it. Whew. All right, guys, so I did it. That is the tier list. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned a few things, and I learned about uh, some figures that really aren't that mainstream, and they should be. You know, there's a lot of figures in here that I was really pleasantly surprised to learn about. I can't believe I did it. This is like a almost a 500-year period of history. So I hope you enjoyed it. But, and as always, stay healthy, stay classy, and stay wild.